Welcome to the Watchman Privacy Podcast. I'm Gabriel Custodiat, a privacy consultant and author of The Watchman Guide to Privacy, available on Amazon. I also offer a Bitcoin and crypto privacy course at bitcoinprivacycourse.com. Either of these supports the show and makes sure it keeps going. You can find links in the description. Today I spoke with Max Hillebrand, an all-around interesting guy with a background in economics, a deep interest in privacy, and some advanced privacy techniques, and a contributor to the Bitcoin privacy wallet, Wasabi. I recorded this episode back in March of 2022, when I was working on my Bitcoin course. So we talk mostly about Bitcoin, with some deviations on other themes, such as when Max shares his digital privacy tool preferences. One small note here about the Wasabi Bitcoin wallet that we mentioned in this show. Just before this episode was recorded, Wasabi made a statement that it would begin to make judgments about who could use its coin join features. The idea was to screen for criminals. Many privacy Bitcoiners have fled Wasabi since then, but Max defended Wasabi and gives a summary of that defense toward the end of the show. I would encourage you, the listener, to investigate Wasabi's policy, do it objectively, and then listen to what Max has to say. In the interest of giving my own thoughts briefly, since I do have a voice in the Bitcoin community, I simply recommend other wallets such as Sparrow and continue to do so. Still, I encourage you to investigate the matter with open eyes and use it as an opportunity to understand how to be informed about what is happening with the Bitcoin tools that you use. And I do want to say more importantly that I genuinely invited Max to the show, not so much to discuss this matter as to get his thoughtful views on Bitcoin and how the world works. He's one of the greatest contributors on the topic out there and he doesn't disappoint on this episode. I am pleased today to be speaking to Max Hillebrand, and he is a uh, software developer, a privacy advocate, a Bitcoin advocate, among other things. Uh, Max Hillebrand, welcome to the Watchman Privacy Podcast. How's it going? Well, thank you very much, Gabriel, for, for inviting me. I discovered some of your uh, episodes and listened through them, and they're really solid. Uh, you, you have some great focus on personal privacy and sovereignty uh, actionable tools and tricks uh, and tips. And that's really valuable in today's crazy day and age. Well, for sure. And this is your bread and butter as well. So I'm happy to get your your thoughts. Was there anything else that um, I just kind of gave a broad overview of of what you've been up to? What, uh, what are some more specific parts of your bio that people should be aware of? Maybe one clarification is that I, I wouldn't really call myself a developer. Um, I'm, I'm mainly a, a user of code. Uh, and contribute on the very high levels. You know, maybe I can write a couple lines of Bash script, but that's basically it. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm first and foremost a economist uh, by trade, and uh, discovered the Austrian School of Economics before I even fell down the Bitcoin rabbit hole. Uh, so that's always been my bread and butter, uh, basically. Uh, but then that also led me, especially through discovering Bitcoin, into the cypherpunk philosophy, uh, and uh, then the strategies that cypherpunks apply to protect their their freedoms uh, and that was a yeah phenomenal rabbit hole for the last couple of years, and I'm enjoying every bit of it. Let me start by asking a basic question about Bitcoin. It seems like a lot of people, of course, in interested in Bitcoin are, are just interested interested in seeing a number go up on on a screen. And a lot of these people who are investing in Bitcoin, of course, they don't even know what a private key is, um, and they just have their uh, Coinbase and Kraken accounts, and, and they're hoping that these things go up, but it also seems to me that there is a, a different group of Bitcoin advocates, such as you, who understand it and its consequences a little bit more fully. That is to say that uh, Bitcoin is a competition to fiat currencies, and consequently, it is a competition to government taxation power and all of the things that come from that power as well. I'm just curious your your thoughts on, it seems like a lot of people are just talking or, or using or investing in Bitcoin. And they don't know the first thing about how just how truly radical it is. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, really, people, uh, I think, misunderstand Bitcoin as a, just another speculative investment opportunity. And I think the, the fiat mindset over the last couple of years, just with the fiat hyperinflation, has led to the seeking for ever new alternative investments to protect your wealth, uh, basically. Uh, and uh, Bitcoin was first by many perceived as that, right? But when you look closer at it, 
uh, it doesn't have the characteristics of, of an investment, right? It's There's nothing speculative about it. Uh, this is a base monetary asset that is designed for user verification. And right? so we have here a counterparty risk-free digital bearer uh, certificate, basically, that uh, is in its, uh, like as a commodity, basically, limited in its available supply. Uh, and that is a incredibly interesting and novel um, aspect just from the monetary sense of you really a consensus based uh, rule set that emerges digital scarcity uh, uh, to solve the resource allocation conflict uh, with money. Uh, it's really a brilliant solution, but a key part of that solution is public verifiability, right? So the, the aspect that every merchant needs to verify the transaction of every other merchant in order to audit the uh, entire money supply uh, and the transaction history of the entire blockchain. This means that merchants have to reveal certain information about themselves, right? Uh, including the amount of money that they get paid uh, and you know the, the spending condition under which that money can be spent in the future, uh, the Bitcoin script, basically. Uh, so these things have to be publicly shared. And out of that results a transaction craft uh, of, of which or you know where, where the money can be or was spent in the past. Uh, and this is something that is also extremely new when we are talking about base monetary assets. So I think of gold, for example, as a counterparty risk-free uh, base money. When you pass it around, the actual you know, token itself, the gold atoms don't carry a transaction history with it. Uh, it's, it's just a, uh, well, purely, I guess, anonymous cash. You know, it, 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 there's no metadata about transactions uh, encoded into it. Uh, whereas with Bitcoin, that is very much the case, right? So uh, there are uh, privacy trade-offs that had to be made in order to ensure the, the verifiable counterparty risk-free base monetary asset uh, that Satoshi wanted to create. And there's just infinite amount of nuance in this conversation of how, how to use this tool properly then. And so let me just get this question out of the way then. And you've kind of answered it right there, but a lot of people will say, well, you like digital currencies, you like privacy. Well, why aren't you using Monero? So wh why shouldn't we, why should we be trying to make Bitcoin private as opposed to looking at uh, so-called privacy coins? Yeah, if, if you want to optimize for reducing the amount of information that you reveal about your, your base layer transaction, then Monero is, is certainly a better trade-off. Uh, the, the technology used is quite brilliant. And um, arguably, if Satoshi would have known about these cryptographic tricks, he would have probably implemented them. Uh, it's just that, uh, it, well, you know, this stuff is bloody difficult. Um, and there's also, however, a crucial uh, design trade-off in terms of verifiability. Right? So uh, in, in, for example, Monero's case, uh, since you have these ring signatures, uh, where uh, there's like an anonymity set of 40 coins that could have been spent in this specific transaction. Right? This means that you cannot prune the blockchain down to its UTXO set to a state of unspent transaction outputs because in Monero, well, there can be multiple, right? So uh, this is one of the inherent scaling downsides of, of ring signatures. And then on the other hand, for, for uh, hiding the amounts with uh, confidential transactions, uh, this it does add additional cryptographic assumptions uh, and complexities in the cryptographic implementation that are just, well, bloody difficult. Um, and we've seen in, in other privacy coins that there were critical inflation bugs undiscovered uh, or at least undisclosed uh, for a while. And that is just extremely scary. Uh, so um, we've had perfect privacy with Xiaomi and eCash back in 1989. Uh, or in 1983, I think even. Um, so uh, privacy kind of was the solved problem and Satoshi optimized for verification. And, and Monero now takes some trade-offs in the design that uh, decrease the aspect of verifiability while increasing the privacy. Right? And that's a really amiable trade-off decision and uh, awesome to have more tools available. But uh, I personally am first and foremost an economist uh, trying to defend property rights uh, and things like inflation as, as direct theft of property uh, is for me the much more important thing to um, uh, protect against. And then this is protected against in Bitcoin by public verifiability of every user. Uh, so this is why I'm very much in favor of being very efficient with the amount of block space uh, that you consume and the, the resource power that the verifiers of the blockchain uh, have to spend. 
I know you're you're fairly outspoken about privacy online. You're, you're outspoken about uh, all manner of things, which is which is great. And I just wondered if you could kind of explain your the underlying ethics or worldview that you use on a day to day basis. Yeah, I'm I'm heavily influenced by praxeology and the Austrian School of Economics in this regard. Uh, Ludwig von Mises has laid out this really brilliant way of thinking uh, about human action. Uh, and since you are a human and since you are acting all the time, uh, this is something really worth considering. And I think out of this can can be derived a whole bunch of things about not just economic insights, but also well, moral and ethical issues as well, uh, and, and strategy likewise. Uh, so uh, basically for me, it all comes down to individual sovereignty and self-ownership and the non-aggression principle and, and the ability to be able to defend your property uh, from aggressors, uh, I think is, is crucial, right? And um, then maybe a bit more specific to how this goes into privacy, uh, which, which I define as the ability to selectively reveal yourself to the world. And this is, a, this is so fundamentally intertwined with human action. And when you act, you, uh, uh, you, there's always a bunch of opportunities, right? There, you have a problem, but there are infinite solutions to any specific problems. And plus, you're plagued by numerous problems at a time. Right? So there's an, an incredible amount of choice involved in how you act. And uh, all of these actions in our hyper-connected market economy uh, leads to other people seeing your actions and perceiving what you do. And the crazy thing is, well, these are all you know, humans and they're complex and crazy people too. Uh, and you don't know how, how they might behave. And, and uh, the, uh, there, there might be a conflict whenever you engage with someone else, right? You might uh, end up uh, stealing your money and your property. So then being able to control how to reveal yourself and what things to say to someone else is just an incredibly efficient strategy uh, to, to live a peaceful life. Uh, because the cost of defense is very low. Uh, the cost is just not speaking up uh, and, and the opportunity cost that is associated with that. Uh, but the resulting defenses are, are quite substantial uh, because if nobody knows about you, well, then what are they going to do? Uh, and uh, this in general is the cypherpunk strategy that I've come to love uh, to increase the cost of attack and decrease the cost of defense. Uh, that is what uh, public key cryptography does, right? Incredibly trivial to create a private key and derive a public key or a signature from that. But if you don't have the private key, you're not getting the signature, right? Or if you only have the public key, you won't get the private key back. That's uh, very easy to set up, very difficult to break. Um, and Bitcoin proof of work is, is likewise uh, as well, right? So these are for me some basic principles of, of individuality and, and how they apply in my life. I don't understand why what you've just articulated is not the basic worldview of, of the average person. Your worldview comes out in your, your excellent um, Twitter profile. And one thing that you're great at doing is pointing out uh, what's happening in the world and particularly how a Bitcoin might be able to and, and is solving some of these problems. And I wonder if you could just give us a few instances, maybe recent or or even in the past of how Bitcoin is uh, solving some of the problems you see in the world? Well, I think the, the biggest problem that we see in this world is, is theft. Uh, that's a, a real fundamental evil. Uh, and, you know, the, the theft that is least uh, uh, like transparent and least talked about uh, is monetary inflation. And, and uh, the inflation in, in the fiat world has just been going absolutely through the roof. Uh, in the last couple uh, years, you know, in early 2020, they started printing uh, uh, money like crazy and increasing the base money supply, uh, which is uh, the uh, physical cash component plus the um, digital reserve of the uh, central banks. Uh, both of this together is base money, right? The the asset without any counterparty risk, and and these have uh, numbers have in the fiat world just quadrupled uh, over the last couple uh, quarters. And uh, that is something really scary to see because that is not just a direct theft uh, of, of savings uh, uh, capital from, from well, everyone, uh, but it also leads to numerous malinvestments and misallocations of capital in deep production stages that uh, will just lead to an incredible amount of, of uh, well, waste. You know, we're, we're just building stuff that we don't really need. Uh, and because of this, the way that we consume our resources now, 
we later can't even finish the projects that we actually do need to to finish uh, successfully. You know, this uh, this is a human catastrophe, I would say, um, uh, the the in hyperinflation of of the base monetary assets. And Bitcoin just solves that out of the box by default for every user of Bitcoin. Like this is just such an underappreciated fact to the extent of of what that does when you can hold a base monetary asset which is uh, completely inflation resistant just by the fact that you can exactly define what you would like the monetary base to be and only you are the one that makes the decision uh, of of your own rules that you run on your own node Uh, that's such a incredibly important aspect that solves really everything that we've seen in these last crazy years even at a more kind of day-to-day practical level, you see the potential for Bitcoin to uh, be, a, be a great tool for people. My, my friend earlier today sent me a, a photo uh, of a collection of cash and precious metals that somebody was trying to get across the border, uh, either in uh, Ukraine, uh, I guess it was in Ukraine, and it was, uh, it was just seized. Um, and of course, that is the risk that you uh, take when you are dealing with states and you're crossing borders and such. And um, if he had had a seed phrase memorized or, or something in, in Bitcoin, um, his life would be completely different right now. Another question I have for you is, uh, as we get to privacy in Bitcoin, you had a great tweet where you uh, tweeted out the entities out there who are trying to destroy privacy uh, in, with Bitcoin. You know, when whenever you use a service, you can strive for reducing the amount of information that you reveal about yourself to the absolute limit or, or minimum that is required for that service to work. And right? so uh, basically a need to know principle and right? only give a service provider that information that he needs to know and, and nothing more. Uh, that's a very useful strategy, right? Because ultimately you still want to use a service. Uh, you just want to use it uh, in a way that uh, other people cannot misuse information uh, that you unnecessarily share about you. Um, and the the problem with Bitcoin is that there is some aspects that you do have to reveal about yourself with every Bitcoin payment that you make. Right? So, um, for example, which coin do you want to spend? Right? Uh, this is an information that just has to be revealed in every transaction by the Bitcoin consensus protocols. Uh, and and same is what was your script, right? What was the spending condition that you are invoking here, and 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 uh, it, can you prove the signature to that? Uh, and of course, the output address that you want to pay, right? and the and the amounts uh, in in uh, for each of these outputs. How, however, the, you know, if you if you look at just those, that's actually pretty limited amount of information. Uh, you know, that's that's not really that much. There's no names. Uh, there are no requirements that you use a static identity. Uh, there is no requirements that you're the only one to to build these Bitcoin transactions. You can be in a group of people, right? Uh, you can use as um, you know out of scope or out of band uh, cryptography to do advanced swaps and transfer ownerships uh, in in a way that's not even in the blockchain UTXO transaction graph itself, right? All of these things are are not disallowed, right? They are just um, not part of the, uh, uh, or th- there is a much broader set of restrictions of what constitutes an actual Bitcoin transaction. And the downside is, well, people didn't know exactly what was those, what, what are those minimum requirements and uh, people didn't build the software that protected the user to only reveal the limit, as limited amount of information as possible. And therefore, users made a lot of mistakes. They revealed a lot of information that they actually did not have to reveal about themselves. Uh, the, the best case here is, is address reuse. You know, in, in the early days of Bitcoin with all hierarchical deterministic wallets, you need to back up every new private key that you generate. And well, that sucks. That's annoying. So you just generate one private key and keep on using it. Why not? Um, well, all of a sudden, you cluster every payment that you make to the same identity, right? That that was not necessary by the Bitcoin protocol. You just did that and attributed this information. Um, and well, there are a lot of these types of user mistakes, right? KYC is another one. Uh, there's no requirement that you need to tell someone else, you know, who your name is uh, before he can make a Bitcoin payment to you. Yet still, so many people do that. 
Well, so because these are all very difficult concepts and not just difficult to reason about, but even more difficult to implement properly in software. And a lot of users made mistakes where they uh, subconsciously, like inevitably leaked more information that they would have consented to in um, in an informed decision. Like, or, um, well, actually, I don't think you can say that, but it's more like that uh, there, there was no other good alternative. So users just compromised without even knowing that there might have been a better alternative. Uh, a lot of people do. And now the question is, what is your stance in such a situation? Right? You could say, well, that sucks. Um, let's make sure that we improve our tools in a way that the least amount of necessary information is revealed to others. Uh, or the alternative is, well, that's great. We know so much metadata uh, where users fucked up. Let's collect all that uh, and let's curate all the mistakes uh, and let's hold everyone accountable uh, till the end of time, uh, basically, for, for the naive mistakes that were made uh, in the past. And while the latter just seems a bit, I don't know, vicious or, or, or cruel, um, you know, the, the presumption of innocence and, and forgiveness is something that's a, a nice decency to have, I guess. And I, I would much rather try to help people avoid their mistakes and learn from them um, rather than uh, you know try to push them down because they have made them. Well, these are these are very deep answers. Just to ask more specifically, we have companies uh, like Chainalysis, we have Blockseer, we have Score Chains. Some of these companies give us a sense of how powerful, how dangerous are these companies when it comes to unraveling the blockchain. Yeah, that's that's a very difficult question for me to answer as an outsider, uh, because unfortunately, these companies are not very transparent with their procedures and their technologies. It's anything else but open source. <laughs> so, you know, it's very difficult to say of what's actually going on uh, inside. But um, so the way that I would judge it would uh, would be that a lot of this relies on cooperation with with other entities. Right. Uh, the prime example here is, for example, uh, KYC. Right. This is incredibly valuable metadata that can be collected about the payees uh, and merchants of, of Bitcoin. And, well, th that, that does get collected by entrepreneurs who provide an incredibly valuable service. Right? The, the service is basically a shitcoin disposal facility. You know, you have your dirty fiat, your dollars and euros and yen, and you want to get rid of that melting ice cube as soon as possible. So you run to the you know biggest company that helps you with that service, which will be some white market uh, big exchange, um, which is just the default, you know, for for normy normy newcomers uh, to the project. Um, and uh, again, there's not really a prominent alternative, um, and so you just go to the default, and that is the KYC exchange. And all of a sudden, your identity is tied at the uh, in point into the system. Uh, with all the Bitcoin that you end up receiving um, from from that exchange, right? And uh, this is now the exchange knows who you are and the address that you withdrew the money to. Uh, and this information now can be shared with other people, uh, especially these curators of metadata of mistakes of users. Um, and th that is, I think, the most serious threat um, I, I would argue it's just that companies collect the metadata of the people who are on the other side of, of the transaction uh, and then tie that to the blockchain information. And let's say that somebody is listening and they're saying, well, shoot, I have all of my Bitcoin through a KYC exchange. I realize now that I want to be more private. What would be the way to for them to erase the taint of that? on these coins so that moving forward, at least, they could be private. I mean, the, the, the first thing, of course, stop using the services of, of such an entity uh, and prefer non-KYC options uh, as, as much as they are still available. Um, how, however, then, uh, since that often comes also with a market premium, right? at least of more time invested probably, and also a higher market price and lower liquidity, uh, you know, that's, again, a trade-off. Um, uh, of of how efficiently can you uh, acquire private SATs directly um, without leaking some metadata to these public databases. Um, but in any case, if you have associated your uh, public identity with a certain uh, coin on the blockchain, 
Well, uh, the the basic goal is to move ownership um, of these satoshis uh, across the Bitcoin transaction graph to a, another output which is not related to the previous. Uh, and there are numerous strategies to do this. Uh, one alluded to earlier is a coin swap, right? Something like the Lightning Network uh, basically implements, uh, where uh, you know Alice has uh, an output of this one transaction and Bob an output of a completely other transaction 5,000 blocks later. Uh, and each of these transactions individually look like a regular payment that Alice made atomically in that one transaction. But in fact, they have switched ownership um, uh, and now the actual ownership of the Bitcoin no longer um, relates to the uh, transfer of Satoshis in the actual transaction itself. And that is promising per se, but it kind of just shifts the problem because there is still an inherent transaction graph on the Bitcoin blockchain itself uh, that, that can be analyzed. And I think a very nice solution to this problem is, is what's known as a coin join, a, a collaborative Bitcoin transaction. Uh, where instead of one user building a loan uh, transaction all by himself, where he is the only one who has the inputs or who owns the inputs in this transaction, uh, he teams up with hundreds of others of users uh, where there end up being hundreds or even thousands of inputs in a single transaction uh, with numerous outputs on the output side as well. Uh, and the, the really, really cool aspect is that even though UTXOs are not fungible, uh, they're all unique with their own public key and transaction history. Uh, in, in fact, though, the Satoshis uh, inside a transaction are perfectly fungible. And so we have a list of inputs and a list of outputs, and each of them has a Satoshi value. But there is no clear indication uh, which Satoshi went from which input to which output. I think more of it of uh, some coins get destroyed uh, and then some new coins get created. Uh, it, it's not that the coins move from left to right. Uh, and therefore, inside a transaction, we have a, a perfect privacy of how the Satoshis actually move. So the trick is just to increase your anonymity set. Uh, and that is the size of the crowd that behaves similarly to you. Uh, just by meaning, uh, put more users into your transactions uh, all with their own inputs and outputs. And all of a sudden, because there is no longer a, um, uh, yeah, a clear link between the two, uh, your coins become a lot more private, meaning they're no longer associated with the previous transactions that you've made. Let me ask you this, for the, for the beginner, for the lay person who, when they start to get into private Bitcoin, they come across this, this term, uh, a UTXO. Could you just explain uh, as basically as you can, or, or for, as I said, the layperson out there, how can we understand what a UTXO is? A UTXO or an unspent transaction output is basically a chunk of money. Uh, think of it kind of like a, a gold coin. You know, you have the individual gold atoms, you know, the, the smallest unit, the smallest fungible unit, basically. And that's the actual numeric value of uh, of like the amount of money that you have, right? It's how many atoms or how many grams of gold do you have? Um, but the the form, the shape that this collection of atoms in a chunk represents can be very different, right? This can be, uh, you know, uh, just a crumbled piece of rock, or it can be a nice printed coin or a, you know, metal bar or some jewelry, right? It, it can take many different shapes. And similarly is a Bitcoin UTXO. And so we have a, a Satoshi, meaning the, the smallest atomic amount of monetary well uh, units, uh, and they are allocated in amounts in certain chunks. Create a new chunk of money, well, the, the atoms, you know, the, the base monetary units, they have to come from somewhere. And, and this is uh, where whenever you want to create a new address with a certain amount of Bitcoin allocated to it, you need to spend a previously generated address on the Bitcoin blockchain. And so this is the input side of, of a transaction. Uh, the input basically refers to which chunk of money do you, uh, are you currently spending in this transaction. Uh, and there can be numerous chunks of money, numerous input parts uh, to a transaction, uh, not just one. Uh, and and by you know in in the naive early day user experience of Bitcoin, 
uh, the the uh, you made a single user transaction, meaning that you create a new transaction that has chunks of money on the input side that only belong to you. And and uh, in that condition, it might be actually quite trivial to find out where you spend on your money because there's not many ways to interpret such an such a transaction. Uh, however, uh, in the actual Bitcoin protocol, again, there's no limitation that there's only one user in in a transaction. It's just a transaction is the destruction of old chunks of money and the creation of new chunks of money. Uh, and that can be many different users from, well, everywhere. In a Bitcoin wallet, you have an accumulation of various bits of Bitcoin, as it were. And you can go in there and you can look at each of these UTXOs and there might be dozens or hundreds of them. And they're all accumulated there, but you just tend to see the the final number in your wallet and assume that, oh, this is this is one chunk. I'm going to ask you about the proper maneuvering of those more granular pieces of Bitcoin, what's, what's often called coin control uh, in a moment. I did want to kind of complete our thoughts on uh, scrubbing KYC Bitcoin by asking you, so it seems like the coin join process, which is available on just frankly, just a couple of different uh, wallets. You have Samurai, you have uh, Sparrow. If one were to use uh, CoinJoin, and that is the best option we have, how confident can we be that CoinJoin is giving us privacy for these coins moving forward? Yeah, that's a- another really big question on how to evaluate the quality of a transaction, so to speak, you know, uh, in terms of privacy. And there are some ways to go about this. Um, the So the general thing when we have multi-user transactions is that the goal of an attacker, of a surveillor, would be to untangle this into the actual payments of the individual users. And so, uh, you know, Alice spent these two coins and created these three outputs, for example. That's what the attacker would want to know, even though he sees hundreds of inputs and hundreds of outputs, right? So uh, this this individual user payment is known as a sub-transaction. Now, when looking at a, uh, at a final coin join transaction, there can be many different sub-transactions that could be correct. You know, it could have been that Alice had one coin, or maybe Alice had two coins, or maybe Alice had three coins, you know, uh, many different possible interpretations. And arguably, the larger the number of possible interpretations, uh, the better. Right? Uh, ho- however, we see that in in coin joins, this number of potential subsets gets extremely large very quickly. Uh, that's an exponential growth. And very soon, no current computer could possibly uh, calculate even all possible subset transactions. However, just because there is a large potential number of subsets doesn't mean that it, it's not easy to find out the one actual subset that is correct. So there are still kind of ways that further improve uh, this by well, I guess the, the, the main solution is to have standard denominations in the sense of equal amounts. Right? If, if there are five inputs that are exactly 1.000 Bitcoin worth right? and uh, 10 outputs, which are exactly 0.00, uh, 0.05, uh, no, 0.500 Bitcoin, whatever, <laughs> but all of them ha- have exactly the same value, like there, there can be numerous different sub transactions that are possible in any case, right? So it's it's a bit difficult to articulate this, I guess. And I understand there's there's a lot of complexity to it, and and really, unless people are in the nitty gritty programming these kind of things, it's it's hard to it's hard to wrap your head around it. Let me let me just ask you this: Would you do you feel comfortable having coin joined your Bitcoin that you have removed uh, the taint? Do you feel confident moving forward after you coin join? In in general, yes. Um, th- but again, there it's all about selective revelation of uh, of of whom to reveal yourself to, right? And um, in in some cases, you don't even want to use a coin join, right? So uh, let's 
uh, let's say, and, and this goes, by the way, into coin control and, and why this is so important. So let's say, Gabriel, you, you sent me some money uh, for uh, well, providing you with a great steak dinner, for example. Uh, and, uh, you know, later uh, I go and buy your Watchmen Guide to Privacy uh, and want to reward you for that awesome knowledge. So I, I want to pay you in Bitcoin again, right? Now, um, the, the question is, uh, what information do you already know about me uh, before before making that second payment, right? And and how can I shape my actions so that you don't learn more information about me than is necessary, right? Well, you already paid me in the past, right? I sent you my address, and and so you know that this address is mine. So yeah, you know that I have this coin worth 0.1 Bitcoin, uh, and I received it in this block, right? If I have still not spent it, right, that that did not change. So. I, when now paying you, I might as well select that coin that you have previously sent me and, and just uh, destroy that in the transaction that pays you. And the cool thing is, after this payment, you still don't know any other transaction that I've made in the past, right? Or any other coins that I'm involved with. Um, and, and this would be different if, for example, in the second payment, you know, I, I pay you with a coin that I received from my mom, for example. Uh, and then... Uh, if I now take the coin from my mom, let's say she gave me 10 Bitcoin for my birthday, because why not? <laughs> and then uh, now I pay you out of this 10 Bitcoin coin. Now, you know still that I got the 0.1 Bitcoin that you gave me previously, but you now also know that I got these 10 Bitcoin from somewhere, right? You might not know about the metadata of the actual PE, but you at least know that this coin exists and that I control it. Uh, and this will be now additional information that that is revealed, right? Maybe you're, maybe I'm all right with that uh, because, uh, well, I, I trust you or, or whatnot. But well, maybe not, especially considering that other people might find this out as well. Um, and here is where coin control is essential, right? If if you want to control how to selectively reveal yourself to others, specifically the merchant whom you're paying to, right? Then uh, knowing metadata about your own coins in the sense of who has sent you this coin in the past, right? who knows that this coin is yours, basically, uh, and how you're going to spend it uh, today then by, by selecting the coins that are specifically known by this entity. Uh, these are things that can and should all be considered when, when making Bitcoin payments. Moving along as regards the ways to accumulate private Bitcoin without going through a KYC exchange, we've talked about ATMs in the past. We've talked about the the ways to find other human beings to uh, trade with them. A lot of that is just trial and error and getting out there and, and figuring it out. I wanted to pose this scenario to you. Let's say that you have someone who wants to invest in Bitcoin and they also want privacy. So they recognize that buying 40,000 euro at once is probably not an option if one is doing it privately. But maybe they also don't want to get Bitcoin in dribs and drabs like 400 euro from an ATM or a mining setup now and then. So what about that mid-range for, let's say, 4,000 euros or so? Do you have any thoughts on how, how one might approach accumulating a lot of Bitcoin privately in a short-ish amount of time? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, stuff gets more difficult the more and more money you have uh, or, or, or... and. Uh, th that also goes for for buying Bitcoin, um, and uh, you know this range of of uh, four thousand to fifty thousand dollars, something like this. Um, you would be surprised of how many Bitcoiners there are uh, that you know have some expenses where the merchant insists to have uh, fiat currency, and th therefore they want to get rid of some Bitcoin uh, to to pay that merchant in fiat. Um, and you you can find these people and. Uh, you know, in, in this price range, it's certainly still still possible. So uh, there are, you know, meetups of Bitcoiners uh, where, where you could get to know such people uh, or uh, just friend of, friends of friends. You know, there are certain chat groups uh, that are, you know, optimized for, for local and cash uh, Bitcoin deals. Um, and once you get a bit more involved in the community, you will find reputable people um, whom, whom you can trust to make honest deals, uh, where hopefully they don't snitch on you. Um, but yeah, if if you know if it's then really some some more serious amount of wealth, you know, a hundred thousand dollars or upwards, 
which, you know, with today's dollar hyperinflation won't buy you a loaf of bread anytime soon. But <laughs> um, it, it's, it, you know, it, it, it might get tricky. And uh, this is, again, you know, where because of a lack of tools, uh, individuals will compromise on their privacy and reveal more information than is necessary. Uh, and and that really is a sad thing. So, uh, you know, uh, plus also a lot of this trouble arises from the uh, fiat banking layer. Right? You just have zero privacy in the, uh, in, in the fiat banking system or zero anonymity, let's say. Every payment is associated to you. Um, and that just makes buying Bitcoin uh, truly privately, even on the fiat side, very difficult. So I guess the the... A well, better alternative for me was always to to earn Bitcoin directly from my goods and services. Uh, this this is something where I mean, sure, your business might be associated with your name, but um, you uh, the, the actual amount uh, or the actual coin that you end up receiving is is, is certainly very distributed and difficult to find out, uh, especially if you don't reuse your addresses and use some uh, you know nice payment processing solution like BTC Pay. Um, there. Uh, once you're fully inside the Bitcoin economy, uh, then uh, uh, the the privacy game changes uh, drastically, right? So um, getting into Bitcoin privately is difficult, especially at scale. Uh, but then once you're fully in it, uh, you can improve the situation, right? And here's where CoinJoin, uh, again, uh, comes in beautifully. Yeah, I think you're right that finding somebody being part of one of these communities where you can obviously learn more, but also have a, a chance to to trade cash and other things for Bitcoin is is really a good option. You could even use one of these blockchain explorers and maybe uh, track down this person's wealth and then say, hey, look, I know you have uh, 10 <laughs> Bitcoin. I'm sure that would uh, be a good uh, way to introduce yourself. Um, <laughs> Let me ask you briefly about the Lightning Network, not so much about the, the theory behind it. I guess we could ask if it's a privacy solution at all right now, but is it feasible for new people to get into? And, and maybe what would be your kind of first steps for people uh, if, you, if you do recommend it to get started with the Lightning Network? I think Lightning Network can be a really beautifully designed privacy solution but it's it's not it, it's awesome in some ways but it's really not yet there in other ways uh, and you you know there there are different trade-offs because again uh, you know lightning is is clunky today uh, and you can remove a lot of this clunkiness by adding trusted third parties and service providers right and uh, that removes a lot of the un uh, uneasiness in the ux right these lightning service providers for example uh, however, then if you're not careful of how you implement that, this Lightning service provider will know a whole bunch of information about you. And one uh, if a, a perfect example for this is, is Phoenix Wallet, uh, a incredible UX for a Bitcoin Lightning Wallet. Absolutely ridiculous what these guys have achieved on, on this realm, uh, like ease of use, phenomenal. H however, you know the the service provider knows uh, every destination uh, of the payment that you make and, uh, you know, how much money you received and when. Uh, that's quite sensitive information. In that sense, you know, Lightning for, for these users, not really that private. Uh, however, you can go, you know, the the other extreme and, and use Lightning properly and to its most sovereign extent. So you run your own Bitcoin full node, you run your own full Lightning network node that has a full copy of the transaction graph. Uh, you open your own channels to controlled and maybe even trusted individuals um, uh, you, who you know are, are not surveillance uh, entities. Uh, and then uh, uh, with, uh, uh, you know, set rather low fees so th that you get some uh, routing traffic uh, as kind of tra cover traffic for your own payments, which is, by the way, the really cool aspect of Lightning, right? You can, uh, other people can make payments through your UTXO payment channels that means that whenever you make a payment, it's all of a sudden no longer sure of, is this just another payment being routed through the node on behalf of some other user? Or is this actually an, a payment that initiates or, or results by that node? So there's a, a lot of design spectrum here. And I don't think that we have a nice wallet with great UX that has all the privacy best practices necessary that would make the current protocol of the Lightning Network uh, great. And I think in part that is because a lot of the protocol uh, specifications can and are being improved on in terms of privacy. You know, Taproot was a fundamental 
improvement or a, a fundamental enabler for numerous improvements across the entire spec of the Lightning Network, basically. Uh, and that's still being worked upon in to specify and and implement and review. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I wish I could say Lightning is is a perfectly private system already. Uh, it has the potential to be, but there is a monumental amount of work left to be done. It's not going to be boring. Fair enough. Let's take a slight tangent here. And I want to do a, if you're willing, a rapid fire section with you and your digital privacy tools. What is your preferred uh, password manager? Pass uh, or password store, a command line utility that uses PGP encryption. Excellent. Uh, VPN. Uh, I loved Crypto Hippie, but unfortunately they shut down uh, because of a lack of usage. Um, I guess Mulvat is the next best alternative. Uh, for, for many use cases, you can self-host your, your own VPN, but for you know cover traffic, uh, that is not a solution. Mulvat's account system and, and Bitcoin acceptance is a quite nice trade-off. What about your preferred 2FA application? Oh, um, that's a good one too. Uh, I, I guess it's actually the YubiKey hardware token. You know, ha having hardware secure elements in your setup is, is really nice and actual physical uh, private keys, so to say. Uh, that That's cool. Um, it, other than that, the uh, time-based uh, two factors, there I wouldn't really say I have an, a preferred option. I, I guess I'm using that uh, the, the YubiKey app as well, uh, the, the time-based one. Preferred daily driver operating system. Oh, Cube's operating system. Uh, virtualization and compartmentalization is is a really cool concept and Cubes drives it down to the fullest. Uh, prepare yourself with lots of RAM. I started out with eight gigabytes of RAM and it was a pain because after like eight virtual machines, it started complaining. Uh, so gradually I, I upgraded to 64 gigabytes of RAM. <laughs> you know, but, but but this, you know, it's it's crazy cool, Ben, if you have such a machine that, uh, because all of a sudden I have like on average, like 30 virtual machines running in parallel, you know, like Twitter has a dedicated virtual machine, GitHub another one. Uh, like, you know, numerous one for chat messages. It's it's great for handling NIMS because you have actual virtualization of the operating system that is uh, corresponding to different NIMS. Yeah, lots of improvements uh, once you get through the learning curve. curve. I'm glad I'm asking these. You're, you're, clearly, you're clearly hardcore on the privacy. What about your daily driver phone operating system? Uh, for a long time, I gave up on phones and didn't have one uh, because they were just such disappointing surveillance tools. That's the best operating system of all. Yes, but then then I kind of cave in, um, especially with communications while being on the road. Oh, and navigations. Uh, you know, if, if you live in a truck and uh, you are a lot on the road, uh, it's incredibly useful to know where you are in relation to the map. And since my laptop has no GPS, that was a pain in the ass. <laughs> and eventually I caved down and, and uh, now I have a, a pixel and running graphene operating system. What percentage of your browser usage would you say is in the Tor browser? That's another great question. Well, with cubes, it's a bit difficult to say because most of my virtual machines are routing through SysUnix. So at least I, I, I get the benefits of the anonymity network, even though I might not be in the Tor browser itself. And what I use in cubes excessively is also disposable virtual machines, especially of Hunix. Uh, so you just wrap up a new uh, virtual machine that has a fresh Tor browser install. And then you browse, and for each website, you basically get a new disposable virtual machine, uh, which is, I guess, the ultimate death to cookies and browser tracking. <laughs> um, and so that's a lot of it. Um, is that slow? Um, you know, booting the virtual machines does take some time. Uh, and this is why I like to have like, you know, three or at least two or four, uh, you know, virtual machines open in preparation for when I do my browsing. And then whenever I browsed one item, I just shut down that disposable virtual machine and open up the next one in preparation for the next search that kind of gets around it. What about your preferred search engine or search engines? Yeah, another good one. Uh, I don't think there's a good option. Yeah, I'm, I'm torn here, right? Because I mean, for one, it's about the actual search experience and they're only Google and Bing basically available. Right, uh, and here I would probably prefer the results of Google. They're they're more valuable, right? But then, of course, the default use of those search engines is absolutely horrible. So you're going to use some third-party search aggregator like uh, DuckDuckGo or or StartPage, um, and uh, on that, you know, unfortunately, StartPage uses Bing, which is the worst search result, and DuckDuckGo uses Google. 
Um, but I would say that I guess the philosophy uh, of StartPage and their long-lived reputation and hardcore privacy stance is, uh, I guess, something preferable. Um, so I'm kind of torn on this one, but uh, usually it's DuckDuckGo for me if it comes down to it. Do you use a VPN on the router level? Uh, that depends on where I am. Um, but uh, one actually thing as, as a nomad, um, ha having a router is, is another piece of critical infrastructure. Uh, and another really cool thing that you can do with uh, is to have a dedicated uh, Android device, uh, which has, um, well, currently Calyx uh, only uh, flashed um, because this still enables eSIM support. And so you can have a dedicated hardware uh, with a somewhat hardened operating system to get eSIM support as a hotspot for your main driver, um, which uh, it has all the apps installed. And on, on this setup, I do have VPN on, on this router phone, uh, so to say. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, so I guess it depends. I figure if you are if you're a nomad, then maybe a VPN on the router level is, isn't as important as somebody who is uh, living in the same place. I didn't realize you were a nomad. Is that a, is that a philosophical privacy sovereignty kind of decision? Oh, another great one. Yes, all of that, um, mainly because it's a whole bunch of fun. Uh, you know, to 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 see the world and to travel and to have a very large garden, <laughs> basically, uh, and a large front yard. That's nice. Um, and just that aspect to be able to choose where you want to wake up the next morning, I always found an incredibly liberating aspect. Uh, like this is a level of choice that is just, you know, so many people stick with the default on that option. Like everyone just wakes up home, you know, uh, every morning. Uh, but when you're a van nomad, like, you know, you have a home, you have a box, but the box is on wheels. So where are you going to put the box? And that's, it's a very, yeah, it's a very fun experience. Let me move back to uh, finish up on, on some of these Bitcoin questions. Let me ask you, what are some of your favorite Bitcoin resources? What would you throw out there for people to track down websites, uh, podcasts, uh, books, anything like that? The Bitcoin Optech newsletter is is phenomenal. It's a great curation of the more technical side of what's going on in the Bitcoin Dev mailing list and on IRC with new proposals. Uh, that's great to follow. Um, I guess uh, on the podcast side, the uh, you know crypto or Bitcoin Audible by Guy Swan is a great curation of interesting articles in the space. So that's a nice uh, curated form. Let's say that you are in a Ukraine situation and how would you get your Bitcoin out of a particular country, assuming that it was already in that country to begin with? How would you ensure that you had access to that Bitcoin when you get to your destination crossing a international border? Yeah, right. Where is Bitcoin even in the first place? Right. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's all about uh, knowledge of information of access codes, basically. So you just remember your seed phrase and, and then check back in when you access your computer on the other side? That's certainly one option, right? To, to memorize your, your Bitcoin key entropy directly, um, which, uh, sure, but that's, I, I guess, somewhat limited. Um, however, what you can do is you encrypt your Bitcoin entropy, right? And then you have encrypted ciphertext, which you can, you know, uh, upload to a server or change into some steganographic picture or whatnot. Uh, and you memorize the passwords to the encryption uh, payload. And so um, this is something that's also very interesting because in many cases, when we're dealing with Bitcoin, sure, if you have your key entropy, uh, that's a good first step in, in reclaiming your money. But especially in terms of privacy, Right, you want to keep metadata, like for example, the, the labels of who has sent you that money and, and other metadata that you keep for yourself, right? Or account segregations and stuff like this. Um, in, in the multi-sig sense, you will want to keep backups of, of your script policy uh, and configuration and, and things like this. Um, uh, you know, output script descriptors are much more expressive than just key entropy. Uh, well, what kind of cloud service would you trust even with a folder that is encrypted? Yeah, that's another great question, right? Um, and the cloud is just someone else's computer. Uh, so preferably the computer is yours. 
uh, you know, you can just plug in an old laptop, uh, you know, put Debian on there and run a public Tor hidden service. Uh, and voila. Um, right. Uh, right. You, you, you can do that. Nextcloud is a great alternative for this. Um, and uh, I guess that's definitely preferred. Uh, however, you know, when we're dealing with encrypted payload, um, uh, trusted storage providers are, I think, a reasonable trade-off for most people. Um, and, you know, you can you can further improve things. You can use stuff like Shamir secret sharing. And so you have a passphrase uh, on, on top of your Bitcoin entropy kind of too. So you get encrypted payload and then you make a Shamir secret sharing ceremony of that encrypted payload, splitting it up in 10 pieces uh, in a way that you need at least seven of those pieces to recreate your encrypted payload. And then now you have 10 data packages that you put on 10 different service providers for cloud servers. Uh, and uh, then uh, still seven of these people would have to collaborate to get the actual encrypted payload, which they still cannot decrypt right, because they don't have your password. Um, so, you know, you can get really crazy with these types of schemes. Uh, and then also, you know, include, uh, for example, USB sticks, another genius thing, you know, and, and SD cards. Um, you can put, uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah, like uh, keeping secrets is a lot more than just writing down, you know, 12 or 24 words. Uh, and uh, you can become very expressive and creative in this design. Like there's very little boundaries of what's not possible. Uh, so, yeah. Um, uh, but also, of course, don't roll your own crypto, right? Um, uh, keep it simple and keep it well documented in a spec. Um, because otherwise it's going to be a mess to recreate um, for you and for other people in the case that uh, you lose access or capability. I did want to get your thoughts on uh, recently Wasabi Wallet has been having some problems. What are your thoughts on that? Or if you don't want to directly talk about it, maybe some of the lessons learned from that. Yeah, so Wasabi is free and open source software uh, that implements a centralized coin join protocol. And so uh, this is a client and server protocol where we have a single um, server. Uh, think of it as a chat room where you write a, a PSPT, uh, like a partially signed Bitcoin transaction, you know, uh, with inputs and outputs and signatures ultimately. Uh, and this is a public uh, chat room where people can connect. Uh, and prove to the room that, hey, look, uh, I can have control of this input and I want to spend it. And um, uh, later I they say, and this is the output that I want to create with this amount of Satoshis, right? Um, now, as explained earlier, right, these collaborative coin join transactions can improve the privacy of users substantially. Um, and uh, the crucial thing though, is this is a centralized server, right? So you're using the computer of someone else uh, to talk to uh, uh, other people. Um, and the fundamental kind of design constraints in sense of what do you have to reveal about yourself to that coordinator is specifically which single input do you want to register here? And so every input registration is separate uh, with new Tor identities, but still you need to tell the coordinator which input uh, do you want to register? Um, and, and, well, Fortunately or unfortunately, I guess, uh, the co a coordinator can say no uh, to, I, I don't allow you access to my server um, based for whatever reason, but of course, especially because they know about the coin that you want to register. Uh, and there can be metadata associated to this coin outside of the blockchain, outside of the, the fungible concept of, of the Bitcoin transaction grants, uh, graph uh, that... Um, well, I, I guess increment or that will lead the coordinator to just not be comfortable with allowing you as a user on on his chat room. Um, and fundamentally, for me, this uh, I'm a property rights individualist maximalist. You know, uh, if you're using someone else's computer, then you are a, a grateful guest. Uh, and if that someone else doesn't want you to use his property in his computer. Um, sure, you know, entrepreneurs choose with whom they make business with, right? So th that's kind of my, my best argument uh, in, in favor for this. But uh, of course, there's a lot of concerns of what is defined as a, a not uh, a, a acceptable coin, right? What, what is the actual taint 
of the coin and, and the perceived risk factor. Um, basically, who writes the rules for the blacklist and who says which coin is good and which coin is bad? Uh, and this is where I think the the efficacy and the usefulness of the strategy will will come to light. Because, uh, you know, there are known criminals that have uh, stolen money, uh, Bitcoin, or, you know, that have violated the properties of, of, of others in a certain way. And, uh, you know, convicted criminals uh, in front of public courts. Uh, and now we can have, with Bitcoin being a censorship-resistant, complete sovereign control monetary system, um, you know, criminals can have money and you cannot steal it from them. Um, so, so what do you do in this world, right? And the big question for the coordinator specifically being a centralized service provider is, do you want to work with convicted uh, public criminals? Um, and do you want to be associated with that? Uh, uh, especially because this will reflect in the CoinJoin model with other customers uh, of, of your service. And so this was one of the common um, kind of feedbacks or uh, uh, yeah, I guess feedback from uh, other market participants that uh, just bla made a blanket blacklist of all Wasabi outputs. And so uh, anyone who who used uh, these, uh, who used the coin join, um, all these outputs are now on the blacklist to, for example, a KYC exchange um, or, or lending service or whatnot. Uh, and that is just blanket censorship of of potentially hundreds of users just because there is a slight ambiguity that in a you know 10% chance maybe this might be a criminal uh, something like this um and that sucks right because now 90% of the users are are um harassed in in their use of other services uh, and that can be tried to to be alleviated and so to have these rounds uh, that are blacklisted in the sense of known criminals that are likely to cause problems for other users of this coin join uh, that they will be curated uh, out of this public coin join round right so this would be a uh, blacklisted coin join coordination you you can go even a step further and and uh, at least in concept and say that we will have uh, whitelisted coin joins you know invite only coin joins where uh, you selectively invite who can register coins um uh, to to this coin join and I would argue that is still an ethical and useful service to provide. And right? if you want to coin join among your friends and you only want to invite certain people to participate in that round, sure, I see nothing wrong with that. I think it's just crucial that we have technology that um, increases the optionality of users uh, first and foremost. Right. So um, uh, even though I think that these blockchain heuristics to uh, target or identify um, criminals are are flawed in concept and have many false positives and false negatives, and therefore a kind of successful um, uh, censorship of criminals is going to be very difficult, if not uh, impossible. Um, I, I do see that some companies, some coordinators uh, will choose to go down this road, uh, but I'm also convinced that we will see other coordinators um, that are free speech maximalists uh, and say that hey, this does not make uh, sense. We will just not discriminate our customer base as long as you have a valid Bitcoin input and as long as you provide a signature uh, and you don't disrupt the service for other users, you're happy to, to join uh, this communication room. Um, so ultimately, uh, in, in the realm of centrally coordinated coin joins, uh, this is a potential censorship vector that the coordinator can either do willingly or be coerced to do Right? Uh, and that's just in the fundamental design scope of it. But I don't think that that's a fundamental problem of centralized coin joins because uh, the free market solves this. Right? If, if we have many entrepreneurs providing services, uh, then uh, they can provide different services to different users. Uh, and if users can choose which service to participate in, then uh, that will lead to the most value possibly being generated in, in a positive sum game. Uh, so yeah, this is a... A kind of unfortunate event um, and probably communicated very badly, uh, but but ultimately I I think that this is uh, something that it, it was to be anticipated and uh, ultimately not that bad uh, since freedom of choice will prevail. That's a that's a fair and suitably high level 
response on, on the situation. I'm just curious uh, what wasabi is going to do now, because I mean, it, it wasn't grandma next door who was using the wasabi wallet. It was hardcore privacy people. And they're the people who are totally on top of these news stories. So I don't know who's going to to be uh, using Wasabi Wallet in, in the upcoming weeks, but that's that's not our problem. You know, as as you were saying that, I I was thinking about my my own thoughts on ethics and privacy. Obviously, I talk about privacy things and I give strategies, and I have a a, a book um, talking about how to be invisible, how to escape from things, and. So uh, obviously, at, at some point, and, and I have gotten the question, well, aren't you, aren't you aiding and abetting evil people? And my response is, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know who <laughs> I'm aiding and abetting. I don't have any information on uh, who consumes my information. Now, if I did, uh, I sure, I might make decisions about uh, not helping people who coerce others. And I use the, the term coerce fairly broadly. But I do think it's a better way to not have information on uh, people or customers. And people, the, the idea is, Max, is that Gabriel Custodia, you should be you should be solving evil in the world by keeping tools out of evil people's hands. And that seems like a, a very naive viewpoint on how to solve evil. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think that I'm going to change evil by keeping privacy tactics out of the hands of evil people. I think that the, the role of solving evil in society, in life, is something that we need to do in our communities with, with each other. Um, and it's not something that's me giving advice on privacy tactics. That's, that's, not, that, that's not the jurisdiction that, that I'm in. Obviously, I talk about ethics and I, I tell people um, what, what I think are, are the best ethics. But I don't like, I, I see it as inevitable, I guess, that if you have information, you're going to use it. We've seen, mm-hmm. for example, with the uh, with the crazy regulations on uh, Russian people right now, the Ukrainian, uh, the invasion of the Ukraine by Russia, that even every company has to make a stand and say, those, those terrible Russian people, now they, we are not going to let them buy our video games on Steam. We're not let the, <laughs> McDonald's says, we're not going to let, we're going to shut down all of our restaurants in, in Russia. Like seriously, but with such pressure and they have the power to do so, we're, we're seeing a, leveraging of uh, ownership power over consumers like I've never seen before. Mm-hmm. And it's frightening. It's scary. Just do, your McDonald's serve hamburgers, right? And, <laughs> and leave the ethical discussions to, uh, to society um, and to individuals and their community. Anyway, that's just, that's just a yeah. few rambling thoughts on the matter. But I, I absolutely get your point though. And, and I very much agree. Right? This uh, uh, ultimately blanket uh, censorship just because of race or nationality is is ridiculous. Um, we should judge individuals based on their well individual merit, uh, not because on some group uh, politics. Uh, and you know, it's it's just tragic to see that you know great genius Russian entrepreneurs are now being punished to such an incredible extent and and being stolen from right uh, with with contracts violated uh, and and bank accounts seized. Uh, that is just it's it's criminal, you know. Uh, theft is is not a good thing under no circumstance, and also this aspect, especially with with, with share, you know with you sharing knowledge about how to be privately right, or in Wasabi's case, right, building software that enables uh, pr- private Bitcoin payments. Like just because you speak some certain patterns into the void, and other people start using these patterns and speaking likewise, you know, you're not taking from anyone. Uh, you're you're just sharing information with others and. You know, free speech is a very fundamental concept that cannot be easily dismissed. As, and, and to that aspect of, of having as little information as, as possible, right? Because every information that you do have about your users can and will be misused. And, and this is something that we took very, very dear in, in the design of Wasabi Wallet 2.0, right? Because we actively reduced the information that the coordinator knows about its customers to the bare minimum, right? So for example, in zero link protocol, if, if a user registers more than one input into the round, um, so let's say you have three coins and you put all of them on the input side, the coordinator will know that these three inputs belong to one user, right? That's an additional metadata information that was not necessary, right? Um, so with in Wabi Sabi, this concept is fixed, right? So now you can register multiple coins in an input, 
but each of them gets registered through a new Tor identity and with different uh, key verified anonymous credentials uh, to, to make that possible, right? And by the way, we use some Patterson commitments and Monero tech uh, just to make that possible. Um, but, uh, you know, and so we've, th the goal was to reduce the information of the, that the coordinator gets about the user to the absolute minimum because we don't trust the coordinator, right? He, he should not be trusted with, with privacy uh, and, and with custody of, of funds uh, and, and also not with uptime, right? Um, so there, there must be uh, ways or, but the one thing that has to be revealed to the coordinator is which input uh, gets registered and which output address gets registered, right? There's no way to not give the coordinator that information. But as you say, every information that you give out can and will be used against you. Right? And we just saw in the long term, no, uh, no way where this would not be a very risky um, and, and controversial move. Um, and therefore, uh, let's design systems that are as private and reveal as little information as possible. And then let's distribute those systems uh, based on the free speech open source code uh, that is available. Uh, so that successful censorship uh, of, of users is uh, ex extremely difficult. And therefore, we actually do end up with privacy at scale uh, for everyone. Do you have any final thoughts, any, any places you would like to send people to uh, find out more about you? I know you do um, some consulting on, on privacy and uh, Bitcoin and, and other things. Your, your final thoughts? Well, uh, to conclude, I mean, you own yourself uh, and, and you can choose how to act and, and how to act among others and, and trade with them. Uh, so make this a, a mindful and, and cautious choice. Uh, and stand the ground uh, of that choice, right? And, and don't compromise. Um, and well, there there are numerous tools out there that that can be used. And strive to to decrease your your cost of defense while making it more and more expensive for attackers to come after you. Uh, I think this is a a genius insight of of the cypherpunks that uh, is a very applicable strategy. Uh, and and you lay out so you know in your podcast so many awesome small little things that can be done in your everyday life to just make an attack a little bit more expensive and these small actions do accumulate very very quickly you know I, I wasn't a technologist uh, a couple of years ago but and if you would have told me that um, you know I I would be on the forefront of weird cypherpunk cryptography stuff you know never. Um, but, uh, and my OPSEC, you know, 10 years ago was absolutely horrendously horrible, uh, you know, but, you know, now after a couple of years of just step by step by step improving my setup, you know, I'm running some weird cubes magic on this beast machine with 64 gigabytes of RAM. It's like, you know, it's, it's crazy to how much you can achieve, uh, even when you're not an expert in the subject. Uh, and again, not a coder, not a cryptographer, um, just an, an enthusiast user, uh, but the the results are tenable and um, very impactful. Uh, and I guess that that is what shapes my work, uh, mainly on Wasabi, but but not just that. Um, I, I try to contribute to uh, many of the projects that, that I end up using for, for my daily life. And that's another uh, kind of encouraging and thought, uh, please contribute back uh, to those projects that you use uh, and, and help make them better. Uh, because we're all working on really, really difficult problems. And uh, every additional brain that can spend some compute cycles uh, on solving the problem is very much uh, encouraged and, and appreciated. Um, so yeah, Gabriel, thanks again for, for inviting me and having me on for the conversation. I enjoyed it a whole bunch. Uh, and keep up the great work with uh, sharing your knowledge. Uh, so, oh yes, and uh, my website, towardsliberty.com. So feel free to reach out uh, and let's have a chat towardsliberty.com. And what was your Twitter handle again? At Hillebrand Max. At Hillebrand Max. Of course, I'll have this in the description. Thank you again, Max. Thank you, Gabriel. See you on the next one.